A reading from 2 Samuel chapter 7. Now when King David was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See, now I'm living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord. Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I've not lived in a house since the day I brought the people of Israel from Egypt up to this day. But I've been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Whenever I have moved among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word to any of the tribal leaders of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people. And I have been with you wherever you went. I have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make for you a great name, like the name of all the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over people, my people Israel, and now I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. And when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up for your offspring after you who shall come forth from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will punish him with a rod such as mortals use, with blows inflicted by human beings. But I will not take my steadfast love from him, as I took it from Saul whom I put away before you. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. In accordance with all these words and with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. David is remembered as one of the great kings of Israel. Now, to be clear, he's remembered as a great king, but he's not perfect, not even close. In fact, if you know one story about David, it's likely you know about the time that he used a slingshot to take down a man called Goliath. But if you know another story about David, it's probably the one about his time with Bathsheba and his murder of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. But those are stories that haven't happened yet for David. They're stories for another sermon and for another day. But by the time that we catch up with this part of David's story, he's been placed by God on the throne in Israel. And he's led numerous successful military campaigns that have solidified Israel's hold on the promised land. David felt secure enough to be in the place where they were that he started to set down roots he accepted a tribute gift from Hiram, the king of Tyre, of cedar logs, of carpenters and of stonemasons who took all that and built for him a house, a permanent place to live. For people that have been wandering for generations, getting to settle in one place would have been incredibly exciting. But beyond that, cedar plays an important symbolic role in scripture. The cedars of Lebanon are understood to have healing properties. They're able to do things like drive away illness 
like leprosy. There are symbols and signs of the strength of the nation. And they also point to the flourishing of people of faith. This isn't just lumber like you'd get from Home Depot or Lowe's. This is a palace and a national monument sort of all rolled into one. And after David has been living in this house of cedar for a while, he gets the idea that God should probably have a nice house or temple as well. But that doesn't seem to match with God's plan. God isn't interested in whatever David is cooking up, uh, some sort of quid pro quo relationship. Instead, God goes on to detail through Nathan all the ways that God has been faithful in the past and will be faithful in the future. God says, I've been with you wherever you went and cut off your enemies before you. I'll make a great name for you and I'll give you rest from all of your enemies. You can hear in God's response that promise. This isn't a, a quid pro quo where David has to do something to earn it. It just relies on the faithfulness of God. So much of our world is built on this quid pro quo system. If you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. If you do this for me, I'll take care of these other things for you. And it seems like, at least in this passage, David has the same idea about his relationship with God. That if he wants good things to keep on coming for him or for his nation, that it's probably about time he gets with the business of constructing a temple for God. Something strong and powerful and imposing. Something that shows how serious his faith is. Something that people might even talk about for generation after generation. But through the prophet Nathan, God says to David that God has other ideas. God says, I've been with you every step of the way and I've been in a tent this whole time. I, I never asked for anything else. If I wanted a house of cedar, I would have instructed someone to build me one. You know, this is Reformation Sunday and we talk about things that happened a while ago. And 500 years ago, the church in Europe was engaged in a massive project to try to build a beautiful house for God. They were only in the fundraising stage, but they did go on to build that place that we now know as St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. It's the home of the Pope. And if you've ever seen any pictures of St. Peter's, you'll easily see how it compares to David's House of Cedar. It's at once a, a palace and a national monument and something that's pretty expensive to construct. During the time of Martin Luther, the church was trying to raise the funds necessary to build this building. And one of the ways that it did this was by giving people a chance to purchase indulgences signs of God's favor for them or for a deceased loved one. But when Luther saw what was happening, he couldn't square this with his understanding of scripture and of a, the God that he found in the pages there. What Luther saw in the Bible is the same thing that God recounted for David thousands of years earlier. That God isn't bound up in this, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back, quid pro quo way of arranging the world. God's love is not for sale or trade. God's not a divine bending machine where you can enter the right prayer or make the correct offering and press a button and then boop, out pops your blessing. As I look over my life, I can't help but see how many quid pro quo relationships are in it. Some of them I'm quite happy with and grateful for. I have a mechanic who I can trust to diagnose the, any problem that I have with my car and to get it repaired so that the car is safe to operate and ready to help me do all the things that I hope to do in a day. I trust that he's not going to exploit how much more knowledge he has about cars than I do. I'm grateful for his expertise and for his honesty. But that relationship with my mechanic is fundamentally different from the relationship that I have with someone like my son. You see, if I found out tomorrow that the mechanic that I've trusted for all these years has actually been cheating me somehow, I'd be surprised and a bit hurt, 
But I'd be done with that relationship and I'd find a new mechanic. Because he didn't live up to his end of the bargain. But that's different from the relationship that I have with someone like my son. I can't think of a single thing that he could do that would make me stop loving him, that would make me cut off the relationship. Sure, there's days that he makes me angry, and we'll have our good days and our bad days. But that relationship between us is built on love rather than a quid pro quo. And because it is, it can endure. The love that God has for us is a love that can endure all things. It's not built on saying the right prayers or offering the right sacrifices or following the right commandments. It can't be bought, not with a house of cedar or a stack of indulgences. Our relationship with God is built on God's unfailing love that is freely given through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. It's a relationship that endures all of life's trials and animates all of our mission and ministry. And it's that same love that God first shows to us that enables us to love the people that God has placed in our lives. Not just family, but friends and neighbors, people who God has placed in our lives so that we can share the love that God has first given to us. Be well, dear friends. Share the love of God that has been freely given to you. And in all that you do, may God's light shine through you. God loves you, friends, and so do I.